you, right? Um, so next one is the classification, classification of matter, right? And remember, we, we said matter is anything that occupies space and has mass, right? So everything you see, your, your desk, your chair, um, your whole body, you know, even the air we breathe, right? That's matter. And we can classify matter very roughly, you know, um, into three categories, right? Uh, into its physical form or its state, right? So solid, liquid, gas, right? Those would be the states. And that's very rough, right? Um, but it's easy to do, right? It's easy to see if something's a solid, liquid, or gas, right? And then we can also classify it into composition, right? Which is the basic components that make it up. So matter, right? States of matter, solid, liquid, or gas. And the states of matters can be changed, right? For any um, piece of matter, any piece of matter can exist in all three states. It's just dependent on the temperature, right? And so you guys know that if you increase temperature, you're going to go from a solid to liquid to gas, right? But if you cool the temperature, then you're going to go from gas back to liquid, back to solid. Okay, so let's take a look. What are the differences between the three states of matter? Well, for a solid, you can see that it's very tightly packed, right? That means you don't have a lot of kinetic energy, right? Kinetic energy is movements, right? Or vibration. So you don't have a lot of energy. That's kind of how you can think of solid, solids. So they're they're just vibrating in place, okay? Um, and so all of the particles are like smashed together. There's not a lot of free space in between the the um, particles right that's really the, the the big difference now when you go to gas which is the other end of the spectrum right you see there's big space so it's really about spacing and kinetic energy right there go they go hand in hand okay the reason why there is so much spacing in between gas uh states is because the particles are moving so fast right so you inject energy, right, you inject heat, these particles start to move a lot faster, and so therefore they can get further away from each other, right? Um, and so that's why you have a lot of space, okay? Now, you guys know the difference, like how it looks, right? Um, to your eyes, a solid versus a, uh, uh, versus a gas, and you can feel it too, okay? So I challenge you to put your fist through your desk, right? You can't do it, okay? But I can freely, right? You can freely wave your hand in the air. And that's because of space, right? There's no space between the particles on your desk. So you can't put your hand through it, but you can certainly wave your hand through gases, gaseous air, right? The air that we're breathing, okay? So it is, right? It's about space and kinetic energy. So then liquid must be the one in between, right? So in the liquid, you have a little bit more kinetic energy, but not enough for the particles to be far apart. So they're still more or less touching each other, but they get more, there's more, you know, action, right? There's more movement. And so you get enough space for the particles to kind of roll past each other, right? And that rolling motion, right, is what gives the liquid state um, flow, right? You get flow. Uh, because you do have a little bit more space there um, and kinetic energy, right? So again, any matter, piece of matter can exhibit all three states, just depends on the temperature, right? So cold uh, is going to favor solid, and the warmer you go, you can get to gas, right? <clears throat> so what does that mean about solid matter? If it's really fixed together, which means that, and it's so closely packed, it means that a solid will have a fixed volume and a rigid shape, right? Um, uh, and a solid um, can be classified into two types. You guys should know these words that are bold. Anytime you see bold words on the slide, so you know what they are. So, you know, uh, the... Um, a solid can be classified as crystalline, which means that it has long-range ordering. 
So something like a diamond is called a uh, is considered a crystalline solid, right? Because it has such long range ordering. That means it reflects light at the same angle. Okay, and that's what gives it brilliance. Right. So crystal crystalline solids are like your you know um, your gems, your gemstones, your diamonds, right? Anything that's shiny is going to be um, crystalline um, because of long range ordering. And the other type of solid is called amorphous. This does not have long range ordering. Um, and so it does not reflect light at the same angle and the light cancel each other. So it looks dull, right? It does not look um, shiny like in a crystalline solid. Now, this is interesting. This article came out in 2009. Um, and uh, we now know diamond is no longer nature's hardest material. Yeah. Um, so they did uh, find this lonstalite in a mine, um, and they concluded that lonstalite uh, was formed just like diamond by high pressure, right? So um, it probably came on a meteorite, crashed into the earth, and that impact created, you know, was so created so much pressure that it made lonstalite, right? Um, and so if you look at lonstalite structure, you see that it's also an allotrope of car carbon, meaning, you know, um, it's made of carbon, but it's just in a different uh, arrangement than diamond. And it just happens, it so happens that this arrangement is harder, is more stronger, right, than the arrangement of carbon and diamond. And so that's why lonstalite is stronger, right? Um, and you guys should also know, you know, if... Uh, I put pressure on you during the semester, you know, to do well, you know, uh, don't be mad at me, right? Because all I'm trying to do is turn you guys into diamonds, right? Okay, so let's look at liquid matter, right? So liquid matter, remember a little bit more kinetic energy, um, so it can flow, okay? So what does that mean? It will have a fixed volume, but it's not going to have a fixed shape, right? Because we know that liquid can just kind of flow and fill up whatever shape container um, uh, that, that it's in, right? So it can take the shape of any container. So not a fixed shape, but you still have a fixed volume, right? <clears throat> okay, and then gaseous matter. Actually, very different than the other two, right? Because you have a lot of space in between. So the one quality of a gas that the other two don't have, solid and liquid, is compressibility. Because right? if you have space in between, that means you can compress the particles closer to each other um, and you can expand it as well, right? So as a result, um, gases have no fixed shape and no fixed volume either, right? So a gas will just, just expand to fill a room, right? Whatever volume that space is, it will just expand to fill it, right? Or it can be also compressed into a smaller space. Right, so no fixed volume for a gas and no fixed shape either. Okay, so now let's go to um, classification of matter by components, right? We just did it by states of matter and we're gonna do it by components. Um, so the first division that we're gonna do, first classification is um, between a pure substance and a mixture. Okay, and that's pretty easy to conceptualize, right? A pure substance is made up of only one component and its composition is invariant. Uh, a mixture, by contrast, is a substance composed of two or more components in proportions that can vary from one sample to another. Right. So again, pure substance is made up only one component. A mixture is two or more. Right. Now, there are two types of pure substances. Okay, So further, like a subclassification. Um, you can have a pure element, which is just one type of atom, right? Or you can have a pure compound, which is two or more atoms combined, right? Um, so this category will depend on whether um, or not, you know, the substance can be broken down further. So for example, if you have a pure element, Na, right? It's just pure sodium because it's just one type of atom, Na, sodium. Um, O2, even though it has two atoms, still considered a pure element. Why? Because it's one type of atom, right? It's just oxygen. Now, when you go to water, that's pure as well, but now that's compared, uh, 
considered as a pure compound because you have two atoms combined here, right? So that's how it works, right? Okay, so an element then is a substance that cannot be chemically broken down into simpler substances, right? It can constitute the basic building block of matter, right? So something like helium, right, which is H-E, or iron, F-E, right? Even nitrogen, N2, so even though it's diatomic, N2, but it's still the same type of element, it's just one, one type of atom, right, nitrogen, so it's still considered an element. A compound is going to compose of two or more elements. Um, in most elements, we see, you know, we experience as very chemically reactive, except for like the noble gases, right? We'll learn later that they're not, uh, they, they're actually still found in nature because they're so unreactive. But most elements are chemically reactive, and by now they've reacted to form new compounds, right? And so that's what we see in our world is just a, a bunch of compounds, right? Because elements are so reactive. So when we see we see water, right? Water makes up a lot of the the earth. And um, you know, we see sugar, right? We see sodium chloride, right? And so on. Okay. So now we go to mixture, right? We just did pure um pure stuff. Um now we do mixtures. So mixtures means you got two or more elements or compounds, right? And they can be in whatever um proportion, right? So you can take an element and a compound together. That is a mixture, right? And then you can subcategorize mixture into two types, heterogeneous mixtures and homogeneous mixtures. Um, heterogeneous mixtures is uh, one where the composition is gonna vary from one region to another, okay? So in a heterogeneous mixture, it doesn't look like it's evenly mixed, okay? It's like you can see chunks of one of the component and then over here you can see another chunk, right? So from one region to another, it varies, okay? So an example, a heterogeneous mixture would be a salt and sand mixture, right? So you, um, if you take, you know, table salt and sand together, you can definitely see that it's not a heterogeneous mixture, right? Because you can see, oh, look, that, that's, a, that's the grain of salt, looks white, right? And here's the sand, it looks kind of brown, right? And so um, uh, it's not homogenous, right? It's not even, okay? So homogeneous, homogeneous is the opposite, right? It appears like it's a pure substance. Homog homogeneous mixture, when you look at it, it will look like it's one substance because it's evenly mixed, right? Um, and that means all the all the portions of a sample will have the same composition. So an example would be like if you dissolve sugar in your tea, the sugar dissolves completely and evenly, right? And so it's just look like it's a pure um, uh, uh, substance. <clears throat> so homogeneous mixtures will have uniform compositions because the atoms or the molecules that compose them mix uniformly. Okay, so here's like a little flow chart, right? This is the flow chart that you would actually use in order to, you know, classify matter um, by component. And you can ask a series, series of questions, right? So if you, you know, you have a piece of matter, now you ask yourself, is it variable composition? If you say no, then it's a pure substance, right? You say yes, then it's a mixture, okay? Then under that umbrella, right, under pure substance, you can further classify whether it's a pure element or a pure, a pure compound. And remember how that goes. If it's a pure element, it's just one type of atom. If it's a pure compound, then it's two or more atoms, right? Um, now under mixture, you can subcategorize into two more categories, right? Heterogeneous means... Um, it's not mixed evenly, and homogeneous means it's mixed evenly, right? So something like wet sand is heterogeneous mixture. Tea with sugar is homogeneous mixture. <clears throat> okay, now in chemistry, um, separating mixtures can be very uh, challenging, and that's actually, you know, in a chemist's life, um, they just that's what they're do they're doing. They're just constantly trying to separate mixtures, right? Because when you like do a new reaction you don't always get one product, right? You're gonna get multiple products and now you have to think about, okay, now I have to, you know, pick it, pick out only the product I want, right? I don't want the impurities, I just want this compound, right? Um, so there's several techniques that we've developed to separate mixtures. Um, 
and we can sometimes um, leverage their difference in states of matter, and that makes it easy, right? So, for example, the the method of decanting, right? Decanting is, you know, uh, when when you're trying to separate a solid from a liquid, right? And you can use that difference in state of matter to easily separate, right? You can just decant, which means you pour off the liquid layer, leaving the sediments behind, right? Um, so that's a pretty, you know, um, easy way, you know, of of separating a solid from a liquid. Um, but now what if you want to separate two liquids, right? That's going to be harder, right? Because especially if the two liquids are mixed together. So, you know, for example, something like, um, vodka, right? Uh, vodka is a mixture of ethanol and water. Both are in the liquid state. So how are you going to separate them? Okay. The method actually is called distillation. And you can see the distillation set up here. Um, and it's really interesting here how, how this works. So let me explain. So here you have your uh, boiling flask. That's the flask that has your mixture in it, right? And so let's say that, you know, uh, you are trying to distill, you know, vodka here. Um, so you have water and ethanol inside this flask and you put it um, over a Bunsen burner. Uh, now the Bunsen burner is going to heat up that mixture right, and then they're going to turn it into a gas. In the gas state though, the more volatile liquid, meaning the liquid with a lower boiling point, is going to be present in a greater amount, right? That makes sense, right? Because um, it's the same amount of heat, right? But the, the liquid that is lower boiling is going to be concentrated in the vapor phase. And so then the vapor is directed towards what's called a condenser. And condenser is like a, um, a piece of glassware that is like, um, uh, uh, it's like it has a water jacket around it, right? So you can see it's a, it's a double tube. There's an inner tube where the uh, gas uh, flows. And then you have the outer tube is where the water the cooling water is in there so like it has a water jacket around it that cools the vapor back into the liquid phase and into the collecting flask okay so in the collecting flask what has happened is now you have more alcohol in here compared to water right so what you've done is you've um you know separated um you have at least you know partially separated the water from the alcohol right so if you want to keep doing that eventually you can get, you know, more or less just alcohol in there up to 95%, right? So imagine taking this flask and putting it back over the Bunsen burner and doing it again. So each subsequent distillation, you're increasing the uh, alcohol percentage, right? Uh, filtration is another method of um, uh, separation. And filtration, you know, as it sounds, is you're trying to collect a solid from a liquid. Um, so you, you're going to have like a filter paper and then you're going to pour the mixture on top. And of course the solids are going to stay on top while the liquid is going to seep through, right? The filter paper. Um, so that's a very reliable way as well to separate uh, a liquid from a solid, right? 